This is actually two meetings today. The one is the Committee of the Whole meeting the full town council, and the second is the actual finance committee of which there are five councilors that are members. So as president of the town council, I'll call the town council meeting to order at 2.03, thank you. Do I have somebody to take minutes for the town council? Oh, oh okay. Yay. We yeah. have an official minute, a serious official minute taker tonight. Okay. And, it, um, and I'll call the Finance Committee to order also a 203. I could call it 204 just to be different. Um, and I guess the question is um, for at least taking um, some notes on any on the parts of the meeting that happen after the Committee of the Whole, since the, we do have some additional agenda item topics. <clears throat> Okay. So, I need so to make sure. I'll be glad to do that. Okay, so, okay. but we'll just leave the, the minutes. We'll only, we'll, we'll, for the council, will be also the minutes of the Finance Committee for the point, part that's joint meeting. And, um, Dan, would you like us to introduce ourselves so that you know who we all are? Sure. And, Chris, because you know that I'm Andy Steinberg because I was on the select board before and um, now on the council and uh, chair of the fi council's finance committee. And I'm Lynn Griesmer. Excuse me. I'm supposed to be Zermites. I'm Lynn Griesmer and I'm a District 2 councilor here in Amherst and I'm president of the council. Hi, I'm Dorothy Pam, District 3 councilor. Hi, I'm Shalini, uh, District 5, and member of the Finance Committee. Hi, I'm Pat, and I'm a Counselor, District 2. Kathy Shane, District 1 Counselor, member of the Finance Committee. Uh, Evan Ross, District 4 Counselor. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm Dan Sherman, uh, actuary. I've been the actuary for the town for, I guess, I don't know, six or seven years, or maybe eight or nine years, I'm not sure which. And it's always a pleasure to be back here. Um, I've been doing this kind of work since 1977, so i um, been at it for a long time. Um, but it's great to be here, especially on a nice sunny day like this. Um, I remember the last trip I was here, it was snowing and made for an interesting drive in and drive out. So I appreciate the, the, the fine weather you've given me. So this report um, is on page, page two, is the, what I call the funding report. Post-retirement. And we were sent these oh, yesterday. Yeah. So as they're passing out the hard copies, there are actually two reports. And what I'll do is I'll bring up the header, the, the title page on what I'm going to start with does not have a rectangle on it. The other report does have a rectangle. So there are two reports, and hopefully we'll start with this one that has no rectangle on the cover. Everybody there? Okay. Same title, just no rectangle. So your page two should look like this. At the top, it says Section 2, Required Information. So this report, um, I'm calling a funding report. Now, in the past, um, we've only issued a single report that covers both funding and accounting. But uh, the Government Accounting Standards Board decided that's too simple. We need to make this complex and difficult for everybody. So they said, we're going to establish a new set of rules that says, from this point forward, we're gonna have our own rules that, regarding accounting, and we're not gonna give you any answers on how much you should be funding. So a whole different set of rules on accounting. So um, when that became an effect, I knew immediately that I had to issue two reports, which is what we have been doing recently with pension. You, on the pension side, you've be been receiving two reports, one 
for funding that goes to the PARAC and it requires, you know, how much appropriation you're going to send to the county. Um, and then the second report says, oh, here's your accounting numbers, which is a, on a totally different basis. Um, and therefore, a second report is necessary. So for other post-employment benefits, i.e. mostly the medical side for retirees, I'm now issuing two reports. So this is the funding report. So for funding purposes, what I've done here on page two, which is about 80% you know, of what you need to know, I'm showing uh, two the two different valuation dates. We did this as of June 30th of 16, and next to that is June 30th of 18. And you can see that your value of assets increased significantly. You went from 2.8 million up to uh, almost $5 million as of June 30th. The next item is what we call the accrued liability. This is the value of all the benefits that have been earned to date. In other words, what has been accrued by your retirees and your active people who have you know, some years of service. So on, the, on, on that count, your total accrued liability increased very slightly, uh, less than expected, um, to about $56.5 million. So if I subtract our assets of 5 million from the 56.5, I get 51.5 million, which is your unfunded liability, and it's actually lower than it was two years ago by $2.3 million, and that's a very good thing. It also shows that your funded ratio increased from 5.1% up to 8.8%, which is also extremely good. Um, that is above the norm across Massachusetts. I do work for about 45 um, cities and towns and, and look at their numbers. And at 8.8%, you are above average. Um, and that also uh, is, looks favorable when the rating agencies come in and look at your financial statements, that the fact that you're funding this and you're at you know, almost 10% um, is very good. Um, the next item is the payroll. And the only reason the payroll is in here at 37.5 million is that it gives the readers of your financials something to compare you to, say, the city of Boston or the state of Ohio or anybody else. They can say, well, okay, they have this unfunded liability of $51 million. Is that a big deal or is it a little deal? You know, for the city of Boston, it's a microscopic deal. Um, for you guys, it's a big nut. So the fact that you're at 137% per, 137 gives the readers of your financials some idea as how big a nut this is for you as a community. Um, at 137%, you are above average. Okay, well, in this case, you want the, the percentage to be as low as possible. And most of my uh, plans that are funding um, are up in the 150 to 160, 170% range. The lower, the better. So another good thing. And you drop from 152 million down to 137. So that's where you are in terms of uh, looking at the past. Uh, the next set of numbers is determining how much money you should be putting into the, into the trust fund going forward. So the first element what we call is the normal cost. Now the normal cost is just simply the value of benefits to be earned in the coming year by your active employees. The active employees are gonna work a year of service, mostly. Um, they're one year closer to retirement. They're, the value of their uh, OPEB benefit went up a little bit because of inflation. So that one year accrual is what we call the normal cost, and that's the $1.3 million. Um, item I is the amortization of your $51.5 million unfunded liability at 2.6 million. So that's just a straight amortization, 29 years with increasing payments to pay off the unfunded liability. It's sort of like a, a mortgage, right? If you own a home, you know you have a mortgage, most people have a mortgage and they have to pay it off over 15, 20, 30 years, whatever they select. So your mortgage is the $2.6 million. Um, if you own a home, you also have things like real estate taxes, insurance, heat, light, and so forth. That is your normal cost. As long as you own a home, you have these current costs that you have to pay every single year. So the sum of those two, um, looking forward one year and paying off your unfunded, comes in at a $4 million figure. Now the last line item at 2.6 million is what you're currently paying on, on terms of pay-as-you-go. 
you know, the retirees, you've been paying their, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Harvard, Tufts, whatever medical plans they're in, if it's the GIC or MIA, whatever it is, you guys are paying about $2.6 million today. And so the difference between the $4 million and the 2.6 is what you have to come up with um, some new money. And you've been putting in new money, um, hence you have $5 million in the OPEB trust. If you haven't already been doing new money, um, that would be zero, but you have been. So the, the delta between your $4 million and the 2.6 is how much you would be uh, needed to put in extra above pay go um, each year. So before I move on, any questions on this page? Because this is the most important page. Yes, go ahead. Um, it's good to hear that we're above average um, on some of these things. But I know that nationally, um, most pension systems and OPEGs are not funded adequately. What do you think would be a good number? Um, I, I think the good number is what you're doing, is, is, to, is to get up to the $4 million in terms of the number in terms of a, as a contribution. Um, it, it'd be great if you could, do, like for example, Wellesley, one of the things they did several years ago was a prop two and a half override, and they came up with their $51.5 million. But now, of course, the taxpayers are paying it off over, over time. So they became fully funded that way. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's, there's only one Wellesley in Massachusetts, and, you know, and they did that, and I don't think anybody else could. But almost all of my clients are funding something. They're putting something aside. They're building an asset. Um, I've only got a couple that are not doing anything at this point. Um, and what they're doing, they've established a trust. They haven't put any money in except maybe a token amount. But what they're planning on doing is fully funding their OPEB um, on a going forward basis once the pension is fully funded. Mm -hmm. So some of them on a very short schedule, for example, um, the town of Watertown is gonna be fully funded on their pension in 2020. And they're saving about $14 million. 10 of that million um, is going to OPEB. Um, the other four million is going into some uh, school elementary, elementary school renovations and, and building projects, some capital mm -hmm. projects. Um, so that's their plan. Shrewsbury is the same. They're almost fully funded on pension. And they're going to do the same thing as once they reach full funding, all the savings on pension is getting dumped into OPEB. So it's all coming in the retirement yeah. bucket, if you will. It's just they're dividing it differently once they reach full funding on the pension side, then all the money, the savings is all gonna go into OPEP until that becomes fully funded. So many communities are doing that. Um, others are doing what you're doing is just putting in, you know, half a million, a million, whatever they can scrounge up out of free cash and put that in above the pay go. What do you um, owe the trend that we see here between these two, this, over this two year period? Oh, why? Okay, why? so one of the things I did between 2016 and 18 is I changed actuarial assumptions. So I did, um, in 2016, um, by, the, by the end of the year, I completed an um, experience study. And the experience study said, okay, for, and I had 36,000 lives um, from, uh, 14 or 15 pension systems and looked at mortality, turnover, di rates of disability, all those different factors that go into um, our assumptions. Oh, sorry, I turned that off. Um, so the experience study said that the mortality amongst uh, fire and police was higher than um, the state had been assuming, and I'd been using the state assumptions. So there was a change there. The other change is, the big change is on turnover. Um, the state, for example, and I was using 1.5% per year um, turnover assumption for fire and police, but they were leaving much faster than that, much higher than that. It's more like five or 6% per year. And well, as soon as you say, oh, wait a second, if the probability of a, a fireman or a policeman leaving before retirement now goes up like a factor of five, that normal cost and that accrued liability drops way down. So those are the two main factors that, that affected that um, on, the, on the demographic side. And the other thing that affected it is, is that I had an assumption of, I think, 5.5% increase in your healthcare costs. And if memory serves, um, your healthcare costs did not go up that much on a, you know, on a claims basis. 
maybe some individual premiums went up that much, but uh, people would select a cheaper plan. So any modif there were modifications to the plans and what people selected that also um, helped keep the increase down to just um, $800,000. So I'm trying to relate this back to what we heard at MMA about health care insurance going forward. Paul? The rates going down are not being nearly as aggressive in this coming year. So we switched from being self-insured to, to being fully insured, uh, and we received a 0.6% increase for FY20, which was significant for us, and that has it. And because when we did the switch over, we did a re-enrollment, so there's a, I think that impacted our, some of our assumptions as well. Um, you know, in terms of whether health insurance, uh, the trends are going up as much, um, I think they're, we, we anticipate that they're gonna be stabilized. Um, but they will be going up. There's no doubt about that. It's a question of how much. It's like I'm assuming you know four and a half and five percent increases, and I you know I'm just here less than one percent. That's going to be a big gain for you the next time this all gets done. So, I just think I this is maybe for my benefit, but maybe the other counselors as well, having been part of and still part of the state retirement system. Um, I gather in from a municipal standpoint, it's not just one big pot like the state pot is. Correct. It's Correct. every t every municipality on its own bottom. Exactly. But we still get the benefit of selecting from a group of health care providers that the state negotiates with. Yeah. As long as you're part of that for the, the GIC. Yeah. Um, yeah, you get to select from that group, and they've been able to keep the cost way down. I mean, right. for the last, I think for the last 10 years at least, um, the increases have been 3% or less. Mm -hmm. And the actuaries across the country have all been assuming 5, 6, 7% increases. So that's one of the reasons why. Um, you're, you know, you went from 55 million to 56 versus 58 or 59 or 60 is because um, GIC has been very successful. So, so, but we're not part of GIC. So we're part, of, yeah, we're part of the Maya Health Benefits Trust, which is a group of you know, about 100 cities and towns that have gathered together to, to insure through the Health Insurance Trust. And it's a similar concept of their safety in numbers, basically, right. and so that any kind of increases are moderated over the, the entire group versus a, a, a town that stands on its own uh, risk, basically. Right. Yeah, it's the same concept, the same idea as the GIC. Um, are all the retirees who are on health benefits on Medicare? Um, or do you have some that you're pick, I, I, we're picking up the full cost of them? I, th I think there, there is a handful that are not in Medicare because they were pre-Medicare. Because 1986, if you're hired. 86 is when the yeah. oh, public had to come on. Yeah, but uh, yeah, there are some who are not. Somebody can answer that. So when we're looking at the health care side of retiree, it's their supplemental coverage. There is a handful of um, retirees that are not subject to Medicare that um, we are just keeping on regular insurance and, and paying the penalties. I'm not sure exactly why they weren't on Medicare. We, they were the five percenters oh, yeah. a long uh, time ago. It, yeah, so if, if you were, you didn't have to be in Medicare um, until, unless you were hired after 86. And so if, if they never qualified because they didn't get their 40 quarters, then they, they can't get in at this point. And those, that's the handful we're talking about. This, this is a public employee choice at municipal and state level could opt out. They opted out of, some states opted out of Social Security as well. And then with Medicare, the federal government closed. Not anymore. Closed can't. that. Yeah, but I mean, there were, yeah, my, my husband has never worked a Medicare job. <laughs> I don't believe it was an opt-out back then, not for yep. the town of Amherst anyways. Yep. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Sonia. Never work these things. I gotta hold it, right? Yeah. That one I don't, okay, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but the issue would be if, if you, it's a 40 quarter requirement to be entitled to Medicare, so if they worked a couple years in the town, but the other 
eight years where we're for the state government or the university, university wasn't Medicare before a particular date. You know, so I, I was just curious on how many you're carrying the full cost. Uh, not that many. Yeah. Not that many. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask Dan a question? I'd like you to um, explain to the audience and to the audience at home why our liability went from 100 million to 50 something million. That's the questions we've been getting a lot from people. Uh, so if you could explain that. Sure. Thank sure. you. Um, so the, um, the previous reports, I would do two sets of interest rates. You see at the top that I have 775 for 2016 and 7.5% 7 for 2018. And under GASB 43 and 45, there was a set of rules that said if you're not funding the obligation, you have to use a discount rate that's tied to the long-term expectation on short-term money. In other words, where your money is in the general fund. And your general fund does not earn 7.5%. So I don't recall what percentage I used um, back in 2016, but it was probably around 3.5%. And when you say it's a 3.5% assumed return, it's also a 3.5% discount rate on a future obligation. So if you say, all right, if I have $100 in my hand and I'm going to earn 3.5% on that, how much is that worth 10 years from now? Or if I have $100 in my hand and it's 7.5%, how much is it worth 10 years from now? You're going to get a very, very different number. So. What I do is just the flip of that. I say, well, I owe $100 10 years from now. How much money do I need today if I'm going to earn 3.5% on that money versus 7.5%? Well, at 3.5%, you're going to need a whole lot more money today to get $100 you know, 10 years from now. And so that's what they call the discount rate. So the old numbers uh, were based on the GASB 43 and 45 scenario that you weren't fully funding the obligation, in other words, you, didn't, you weren't paying the normal cost plus the amortization, and therefore the GASB rule says we can only use the short term or like 3.5% interest rate, and hence the liability was more like $100 million rather than $56 million. So it's, it's, just, it's just taking a present value of a future obligation. You know, these payments are going to happen 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now. What's the value today on a time value of money basis? And at 3.5%, you're going to get a much, much bigger number than $56 million. Good? Yeah. So um, the, um, is the rule still that you have to do a, um, the actuarial assessment every two years? That's correct. And the last one was done on June 30, 2018. Right. Um, at that point, we were still operating our own insurance plan and hadn't switched with lower rates <clears throat> that we're receiving now as a part of the um, group plan that uh, Paul was referring to. Uh, would that switch in plan actually help us in the next round, potentially, because we're um, of our rate it, it, it's, it's going to, well, two things are going to happen. One, the fact that you're looking at just, you know, uh, well, less than 1% increase in those rates, obviously that's going to help. So you, that'll create an actual gain. Um, what we don't know until um, we get the data is how did it affect people's uh, choices? In other words, did they switch plans because of the new? Did they go to a cheaper plan or did they go to a more expensive plan? So until you see the data, you don't know the, the, the full effect of that change, but you do know that the numbers are, are probably not going to go up. They may go down, uh, and they certainly won't go up as much as one might expect. I would not expect um, changes in choice um, to completely offset something of, as low as a you know, less than 1% increase in your health care rates. So it's going to be good news, just we don't know how much. Okay, thank you. And, and I just want to, I mean, Sean is nodding his head because he showed us uh, in the regional in the district those rates because of the switching of plans and people dropping on and off did, did make a difference in terms of the overall increase. Mm -hmm. I mean, it offset what was the straight premium increase. So we, 
might see a, a be even better trend when you get 2019 in here. Good. You won't get 2019, you'll get... Do 2020. 2020. 2020. And by that point, we'll have been on the new plan for two years, Paul? Great. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> this just shows the various rates on the HMO and the PPO and the, and the Medix option, which, of course, now is out of date as of today. Um, this page four gives you a breakdown by uh, enterprise accounts. Um, this is pretty popular amongst uh, all my clients because one of the things they are able to do is charge uh, these costs back to enterprise accounts. Um, you know, mo almost everybody's got water and sewer enterprise. Um, you also have landfill and parking, but um, there's a cost line item down there, you know, $84,000 for sewer and $95,000 for water that can be charged back to the enterprise <coughs> accounts and save the town a little bit on their tax levy. This is the other, um, the other 20 percent of the important part of this report. And this is a forecast of what's going to happen going forward, my best guess, if you will. And so you see the same line that we talked about before in terms of normal costs and the amortization and, a, and the total recommended contribution of $4 million and the pay go of 2.6. But you can see where the each of those, the last two columns, move um, going forward. So if you think about where you are now in budgeting for OPEB and where you want to be um, is really the, the arc column. So you want to be able to say, right, we're supposed to be at 4 million, 4.2, 4.4, 4 and so forth. So as those numbers you know, increase, uh, but the delta between the two columns uh, increases slightly to, I guess, about $2 million in 2025. It grows to about 2.8 million in 2031, but then when you get down here to 2046, um, it goes the other direction. So you've reached at that point um, that last mortgage payment of 8.2 million, which sounds like a really big number, but in 2046, that's still a long ways from now. Um, and so what'll happen then is that you'll a cost will drop, you know, from roughly 12 million down to four as you reach full funding. And all you have to do is pay your real estate taxes, insurance, heat and light, and maintenance on your house. And you can burn the mortgage. Um, and that'll be a beautiful thing. So that's the current schedule. Um, there are no rules regarding what this schedule looks like. I have lots of clients that have very different schedules. Some are very short. Some have level amortization. Um, some have uh, other increases. Some have... You know, Dan, put together a schedule that is, is like what you have now until 2024. And then when we reach full funded status with a pension, divert all the savings in 2025 to OPEB and give me that schedule. So then what you'd, what you'd see was a big blip on the unfunded liability payment you know, in 2025 of you know, millions of dollars in some cases. And then they'd be fully funded by, say, 2035, because now I can drop all those later years, the same as a mortgage. You pay off stuff early, you can, you can kill payments at the end. So it's the same idea. Um, and and there's, there's no, no right answer to this schedule. It, it's whatever fits your situation. So one of the things that I can, I've put together is a schedule that you know, people come back to me and say, hey, Dan, we're, you know, we're doing the school thing with Watertown and that'll run out for a number of years. Shrewsbury will say, when we reach full funded, divert the millions. Um, everybody's got a little different idea as to what'll work for them, and this schedule can be whatever you want it to be. There's no rules that say, this has to be a certain way. Um, I'm giving you a 2029 or a 29 year schedule um, that finishes in 2046. I can give you a schedule that says, I'm gonna finish in 2030 or 2035, or I want level payments, I want more increasing payments rather than 4%. So it, you really do have a lot of flexibility in terms of how you pay off um, your $51 million liability. I have a, Dorothy. I have a very um, basic question. Okay, when you do a mortgage with a house and you finish paying it off, you have a house. Mm -hmm. If you borrow money and you finish paying it off, you just don't owe money. So 
I'm missing something here. Um, is this a big pile of money that you don't have to get, go anywhere that just right. sits in a bank earning interest? Right. So it, it does, it's in the bank. It's like the pension. So at this point, um, after you're making all these contributions, you'll probably have in 2046, probably 75 or 80 million dollars and maybe you'll close to 100 million dollars in the bank. Okay, your trust fund will be at least about, I'd say about 100 million dollars at that point in time. So that's your house that you, that you now own. That 100 million will fund your pay go, because you notice um, at that point your pay go is roughly 11 million dollars. So, yeah, you probably have more like 120 million because you have to pay the, um, the pay go benefits with something left over um, and the normal costs will go in. So it's somewhere between 100 and 120 million dollars you'll have. The interest on that and the normal cost will go in and the you know, 11, 12 million dollars of pay go will come out. So the way this thing is, is, is the best practice is to make this thing run like a pension is run. Right now, your pension system, all the employee, all the employer money, all the interest runs to the trust. And the trust makes the payments to retirees. Right now, you have two line items. One line item for the retiree health care cost, a second line for whatever you're putting into the trust. The, the, the way to go is to combine those into a single line item of payment into the trust. And then the trust pays the you know, MIIA or whatever the new, you know, the new arrangement. They make the payments out of the trust mm -hmm. rather than having two line items. So you get down to one. Thank you. Uh, let's see, and then the rest of it, it's, I was talking about in terms of Medicare inflation, I'm using 5% and 4.5%. So the, uh, right now, the 5% compared to whatever the 0.2 um, looks really, really good. So um, those, those are just the various assumptions. There's a whole mess of them. Um, they got stuff for men, women, uh, fire and police, and everybody else. So if we are all set with funding, I'm going to switch and put my accounting hat on. Now, the accountants, um, in their report, they take a completely different look at this in certain respects. And what I want to do is jump down to here. So the first thing that they now have is something called the net position restricted for OPEB, which is page three. And basically, what the accountants don't like to do is use the same words that they use in other pronouncements. So instead of calling these assets, they call it net position. I said, what is net position? Oh, it's the assets. Okay. So the net position restricted for OPEB. So what this is, it just shows a trace of where you were at the beginning and where you are at the end. And um, so what we have is you had 3.9 million at the beginning of the year. In this case, this is June 30th of 17. It's an important distinction. Um, employer contributions at 3.1. This is the sum of your pay go and the extra amount that you put in. Um, what you paid out is the 2.5 million, couple lines down. Your investment income is 421,000. And so at the, if you do the math, you'll end up with four, almost $5 million in your uh, trust account. So that little table will show up in your financial statement showing uh, beginning of year, end of year on assets. The following page at the top is your liability. And that will show from the beginning uh, to the end. And here we start at 57 million. We have what's now, what they call, oh, we don't want to use normal costs. We're going to change it. We're going to call it service costs. Same thing, but they don't like to use the same words, so it's now called service costs. Um, interest on the service costs and the liability is at the 4.4, just moving it forward one year. And now we have the experience gain of 3.9. So this goes back to your question before regarding why did it go down, right? Why didn't it go up as much? And again, it's the same answer, but now you can see how much it was worth. So that was worth $3.9 million as a reduction in your liability. Uh, the benefit payments were, were paid out, and if you do the math, you add that all up, you'll end up at $56.5 million. Um, what's noteworthy is the um, experience gain of $3.9 million, because that'll show up later in this report um, as a negative number. 
So the bottom of the page, the other thing that they want uh, us to disclose is, well, what if you're, you don't earn 7.5%? What if you only get 6.5% on your money? Or what if you get 8.5% on your money? What does that do to the liability? And what does it do to the unfunded liability? So if you, if you lower your discount rate to 6.5%, now the liability jumps to 56 million, partway toward that 100 million they used to show. And then if you go to 8.5, now it's dropped down to 50 million. So if, if you can convince your trustees to, to earn 8.5% over the long term, um, that just cut $6 million out of your liabilities, free money, because now the investments are picking up that portion. So that's what that page is about. The top of the next page, page five, um, the accountants also said, well, what if your health care trend, you know, your, your health care inflation is greater than or less than what you expect by 1%? What will that do? Um, same thing as the previous table, but in reverse. So 1% decrease in inflation um, lowers your liability to about $50 million, and a 1% increase increase it to $65 million. So given those two tables, it gives you a pretty good idea that your uh, liability can move a lot from one you know, evaluation date to another by you know, many millions of dollars. Um, it doesn't take much to move it. The middle table um, is basically what we call the OPEV expense. Now, under GASB 43 and 45, I would show roughly $4 million like we had on that funding report. But note at the bottom of this page, it's, it's, or at this table, it's 4.6 million, it's more. Because GASB says, well, we don't like those rules regarding the um, amortization of ex, uh, experience and, and changes, assumptions, and so forth. We have our own rules. So the service costs, again, normal cost, same thing, 1.3 million. Interest is the same that we had on our previous page, 4.4. But now we have a difference in experience. So what they say is, you know, we had this $4 million negative number that we saw on a previous um, page or two pages ago. We want you to amortize that not over 29 years or 28 or 15. We want you to amortize that over the average future working lifetime of all the participants in the plan. And I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but it's right here at 5.4 years. So I took the... Um, $4 million gain that we had divided by 5.4, and that gives us a credit of $720,000. We also get to use the projection of earnings, which is a reduction, uh, that projection is $326,000. Um, and it was, we actually had a better year than $326,000. The expected return was three twenty-six. dollars The actual was more like three eighty. dollars so, um, or more than that, I should say, because now we have this $54,000 credit because your assets did really well, and that's amortized over five years. It's always five years for assets. But um, two items I, that did not occur this year that I want to talk about is right here. The, the fourth one down is the amortization for assumption changes. If there wasn't a change in assumptions, that would entail an amortization of the same 5.4 years. If you change the plan provisions, let's say you decided that instead of being a 75-25 co-share, you made it 60-40, or you decided to add, um, say, dental coverage, any change in the plan, a significant change, the small changes we don't measure, but if a significant change happens, you have to recognize that change over an amortization period of one year. In other words, immediate recognition. And what all this means is that this number, this 4.6 million, is highly, highly volatile. I can't express how volatile this number is. I've got plans that had a negative number. In other words, they had income from their OPEB on the accounting basis versus an expense because they had some big gains um, they changed the plan, which reduced the liability, so that was a one-year amortization, and they actually had income in uh, 2018. So um, you really can't rely on that expense number for anything. Just recognize that it'll show up in your financial statements, it'll be recorded there, and it will move around a lot. 
Um, the bottom of the table just goes through your liabilities and assets um, and shows, again, your 8.8% funded, shows your covered payroll and uh, percentage of 137. So though this, these numbers are all basically the same as they were under the old uh, GASB rules. So the other thing I did was I included the amortization that I just talked about. So on the investment side, you can see we have a five-year amortization. So 2018, you had a very good year, $95,000 gain. The previous year, you had $175,000 gain. Um, and then you get to realize those gains as a credit of $19,000 and $35,000 over the future. You can see where that comes through. Um, as I mentioned, we also had a very good experience, $3.8 million at a gain there. That's amortized over 5.4 years. And you can see what's left on that going from 720,000 out to 2088 um, in terms of the amortization payments and what's left. Um, the bottom table is just purely for the accountants in the world. Um, one of the things I added is say, I want to see what your net unfunded liability does um, from beginning of year to end of year. And this serves as a cross check to make sure my numbers are right and the accountants, the auditors appreciate it because they do the same thing. They say, well, we got these cross checks to make sure all the numbers line up. Um, so basically, this table just does the cross check in terms of deferred inflows and outflows that um, have changed contributions, revenue, and then uh, a net end of year liability. Um, that's the same table we had before. There's your head count. You had 576 actives and 492 retirees and beneficiaries. Um, and then same provisions and assumptions that we had on the previous table. I'm not going to go through that. I don't, I don't want to put anybody to sleep. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about the accounting side of it. Um, in terms of those of you in the finance, um, sub uh, finance committee, uh, this second report has less interest. The more, the more important uh, report is the first one I went through. That's the one you should really be focusing on in terms of budgets um, and where, where are we going to spend the money. Because right now the accountants have decided they're going to go off on a totally different path. Okay. Questions? Paul. So, for a lot of people, this is the first time they, these are a lot, a lot of people for the first time are looking at this number, these documents, so it's probably really overwhelming to most people in this room. So thank you for the presentation. Um, so can you, in English, sort of summarize where the town of Amherst is in comparison to your other clients in terms of how we're doing on our OPEB funding schedule and everything? Yeah, I, I covered that a little bit on, on the funding report, is that at 8.8%, funded, you guys are ahead of the curve. Um, the fact that you're putting some money, you know, money's aside, I think it was the 700,000. Let me go back to this table on here. So you're putting, yeah, you put in roughly $700,000 above and beyond what was uh, required. That's the difference between the 3.1 million and the 2.4 million. Um, but that difference of, of roughly 700,000 isn't quite where it needs to be. Um, where you really need to be is up here where, on this table, where the difference between these two columns is this is almost two million. Uh, for example, for 2019, um, it's about two million for 2020. So the fact that you're at roughly 700,000 is really good, above average, but you gotta think about the target is to get up to that two million dollar difference, and then a little bit more than that 2.1, 2.2. So um, stay the course, keep putting extra money aside wherever you can, um, and I would, I would keep doing that. Now, I get two questions regarding what happens if we have uh, something, uh, state aid gets cut by 15%. Oh my God, what are we gonna do now? Um, one of the beauties that you have by having this OPEB trust of roughly $5 million is that if you have an emergency you don't have to put in the 700 or $800 million extra that you're putting in now. You can cut that back to zero if you had to. Um, you could even uh, cut back further on your first line item in terms of healthcare costs and actually tap the $5 million if you really ran into a financial crisis. 
because now the five million is like a reserve that you can tap to pay retiree medical. So this 2.6 million, let's say for whatever reason it jumped to three million and you didn't have the money. Well, then you, you can take you know, two, three hundred thousand dollars out of the out of the five million dollar trust and pay, you know, MIIA for that because they hit you with a big increase. So you can treat this as a reserve. Um, it does not require a two-thirds vote of town meeting to, to pull it out like a regular stabilization reserve, but it does act as a reserve if you do have a financial crisis. So having that money is really beneficial for planning and for a contingency in case bad things happen. Do you know when we had that situation last in your first? In terms of a big increase, or, or the state aid cut? Yeah, yeah, 2000. Uh, 2002, wasn't it? Well, there was that one, but they also cut it in 2009. Yeah. And, Two, then, and, and at that point, we weren't able to contribute. Yeah, I mean, more than the yeah, minimum. The, the state. Um, I, I, I'm the chairman of the finance committee for the town of Wakefield, and uh, I'm doing a presentation at our town meeting next Monday regarding the fact that our, I have a chart that shows state aid, and it goes back to 1992, I think. And it nice creeps up until you get 2002, and then it dropped down a bit, and we'll level a little bit, and then it dropped down again 2009, 2010, and now it's back up. It's back up to only 15% less than where it was back in 1999. So, so it's like, we haven't got back to where we used to be. Right. So. Is there now a legal requirement that these funds be made whole? What do you mean by made whole? Oh, oh in other words, if you tap it, yeah, so, so what, let's assume for a second that you tap it and say we have to spend 400000 out of this trust fund because we had a crisis. What you, what you can then do is have a new schedule like this one, but it would replenish those monies over time. You still want to be fully funded. So you got hit, you drop back a little bit, and then you start making it up down the road. My question really is, is there a requirement that these funds now be fully funded? Oh, no, no, There's, no there is no requirement. Massachusetts still does, allows does everyone to do- Do whatever they want to pay do. Pay as you go. Yeah. Okay. And, and I also think the question is, will they change that? And right now I'm quickly saying no, because they have um, a requirement, I think it's up to around $14 billion just to fully, I mean, you're at $4 million? They're at $14 billion. And they haven't put a dime extra since they put in a bunch of uh, tobacco settlement money in 10, 12 years ago. They haven't done anything. So they can't impose anything on you guys until they get their own house in order. So I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah. Well, I, I would just say that I really don't like the phrase tap it um, and that I do not think that we should look upon this as a reserve fund. Um, I am a retiree from the uh, city and state of New York and I'm very proud and, and confident and safe in my benefits as many people are not mm. and many people lost their retirement and um, I, just, I just think I'd like to be kind of more old fashioned about it and to say you know, you can take it out and think it'll get better, and what if it just gets worse, and then you never pay it back, and then the people don't get their retirement. Right, right. And, and, and like a mortgage, um, the longer you pay it back, the more interest you pay. So the shorter you can pay this off and get it fully funded, the better off you are. Yeah, I mean, I've, <coughs> having worked with this for a while, it's always been the philosophy that we have an obligation to future, at this point, future councils and future taxpayers in order to make sure that the town is able to meet its needs and um, as, as in future years. And our taking care of um, OPEB to the extent that we can and as well as pension is a question of protecting the future of the community and that it's our responsibility to protect the future of the community. The other thing, and we'll hear about this in our next presentation, I suspect, is that uh, 
taking that philosophy um, will in fact reduce our borrowing costs going forward as we need to borrow money to do what a community needs to do. Yeah. And um, those are the things that are reasons to be very um, forward thinking in our planning on this, as painful as it is to pay back for the fact that promises were made to employees without funds being set aside many years ago. So we're now catching up for other um, uh, decisions made, uh, that, uh, but, but it's our responsibility to live with the present. Uh, and I guess my other comment in, is uh, prompted by uh, what Ms. Pam said is that um, in Massachusetts, we're at least fortunate enough that um, I think our legislature and um, our governmental bodies were very forward thinking about how to handle pension and getting sure, making sure that the pension side was uh, funded adequately and uh, that that's going to be very meaningful for the town in the future. Uh, just to reinforce it, your first point, um, town of Wakefield, we had a uh, double A plus rating uh, for, many, for a long time. We started funding our OPEB, we're about 15% funded now, we had about 14 and almost $15 million in a trust fund. When we did a new middle school, a couple of few years ago, we went out for the bond rating, of course, you got to go all through the jump to their hoops and so forth. They came back and they cited, among other things, but they decided the fact that we were fully funding our OPEB as a reason that they made us AAA. And that lowered, obviously, our interest costs on um, a $50 million school bond. So that's real money. You know, here you're paying yourself. I'd rather pay myself than pay Wall Street. So I, I just had a, um, it's a question comment, but Andy was differentiating what we've just heard from pensions. Do, is there a similar report that's put out on the pension side of our contributions and funding? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're part of a county system and they issue a report both for funding purposes and another one for accounting. Um, I haven't looked at it, but I'm sure Somebody's got it and others. Yeah, so it's available. It's also online. You can actually, if you go to the PERAC website, you can find it. Um, PERAC is P-E-R-A-C. You just do a Google search for PERAC, um, and then you can dig in, you can find it. So I just thought it was important for people to realize we're looking at just the healthcare side of this. I mean, Correct. these are big numbers, but this doesn't have pensions in it. As opposed to some states um, where neither side is taken care of and they are the ones that get the banner headlines. Oh, I know that all too well. I'm, I'm the actuary for the city of Central Falls and have been for about 10 years. And they, went, they went through bankruptcy. Um, it was very, very painful. The, the Department of Revenue hired me to come in and clean up the mess or help them clean up the mess. Um, we had to cut their pensions, retirees' pensions, 50%. So you can imagine how, how that felt. Um, they are, they are now, their ship has been righted, they're floating again, um, and they're, they're moving forward, but um, the retirees now are getting 75% uh, of what they used to get, 50% from the city and 25% from the state, but they still got a big, a big cut, um, no matter how you look at it. So, Rhode Island, I always use Massachusetts. When I go to Rhode Island, I have several clients in Rhode Island. I always use Massachusetts pension as, as what you guys should be doing because they got the rules in place, you got the funding in place. They've got, you, you can't renege on, on your, contra, your appropriations because your um, uh, assessor's office can go in and, and actually you know, pull the money directly from taxpayers. They don't need you know, town council, they don't need town meeting, they don't need anything. They can go right to the tax people and put a surtax on tax bills or real property taxes to get the pension payments. Rhode Island doesn't have anything like that. So um, I used, you know, Massachusetts as a model for the folks in Rhode Island on how to fix their system. And they've adopted a lot of that stuff, but they still got a ways to go. So anything else? 
Thank you, Dan. Thank you. You're very you. welcome. So, um, Mr. Chair, uh, so next up is David Eisenthal, who's the town's financial advisor. He's been our financial advisor for many, many years. And he'll tell, and you have a bi little biography of him in your packet, and he's going to talk a bit about, um, A, who he is, but then also about our, um, how our bonding and how bonds get set and sort of background on all of our borrowing. Well, talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bockelman asked me to come. All right. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Um, Mr. Bockelman asked me to come before you to discuss in very general terms what is municipal finance. Uh, and kind of the, starting from there, talk about the specific case of the town of Amherst. I want to thank you for having me today, and I'm looking forward to a good discussion. Um, so I'm starting with a very basic question, and I apologize if this is too basic a question, but what is municipal finance? Um, and it really boils down to two issues. It's planning and carrying out plans for the current revenues and expenditures to operate the municipal government. It's also the obtaining of funds beyond current revenues um, for whatever purpose, and this is most of what I'm focused on today. Um, and you may ask, well, what purposes, what are the purposes for which a municipality would obtain funds beyond current revenues? And sometimes it is for operations, deficits, Cash flow deficits, which is more common. Budget deficits, which we see very occasionally. And it would be very unusual for a town like Amherst to have financings of this type. Uh, in the few decades that I've been working with the town, I've never seen, uh, I don't believe I've ever seen even a cash flow short-term note, much less a budget uh, deficit financing issue. It's also unusual for Massachusetts municipalities. So most of what we see is financing for capital purposes, which spreads payments for these items over multiple years. Now, the mechanism for a town like Amherst to obtain funds is the issuance of securities. And securities are basically financial assets, like stocks or bonds, bought by investors or lenders, sold by organizations that are looking for capital, whether they be, these organizations can be governments or corporations or other organizations. Um, the different kinds of securities that are relevant to this discussion would be bonds and notes. Bonds usually have a term of more than a year. Notes are usually one year or less in term. Now, the different types of securities that Amherst would be issuing. Um, general obligation bonds is a fairly common type of issuance, um, what are called permanent state house notes. And I should explain that there is a distinction. There's a program at the state level that's run within the Division of Local Services that actually provides cities and towns with the ability to issue notes, mostly short-term notes, but some longer-term securities without a legal opinion directly. Um, and it's, it uh, reduces the cost of issuance, uh, but, and is particularly for smaller financings is a good way for uh, towns and cities to uh, issue debt. Uh, some of the short-term types of securities, um, bond anticipation notes, revenue anticipation notes, and grant anticipation notes. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the legal environment in which a community like Amherst is operating. Federal law has a lot to say here. Uh, tax exemption. Um, the, the principle here is that the interest income on borrowing for governmental purposes, and that's an important concept, 
So if you're building a school or a police station or a fire station and you don't have any other sort of complications, the, for the holder of that debt, the interest income is exempt from federal and often state, and most of the time it will be in Massachusetts, state taxation. It lowers, it has the effect of lowering the interest rate for the borrower compared to if the uh, financing was taxable. Um, now, the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 had a lot to say about how we operate. And then the um, tax reform that was passed at the end of 2017, uh, the so-called Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, eliminated certain types of financings and also changed marginal tax rates, which kind of, that changed the environment in which uh, municipalities all over the country operate. Federal law also has a lot to say about disclosure and market regulation. The Securities and Exchange Commission has a major role, and a more major role than even in the past, with the passage of the Dodd-Frank Act in 2010. Um, the Securities and Exchange Commission, particularly in connection with the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board, uh, has a lot of um, influence over the municipal securities market. Now, state law governs many details of the issuance of bonds and notes for a town like Amherst. Um, state law, Chapter 44 of the Mass General Laws in particular, governs the types of borrowing, the purposes, and repayment. And we also see the uh, debt limit, 5% um, of equalized valuation, which is a legal limit on the amount of debt that a uh, municipality in Massachusetts may uh, incur, although there is a mechanism available for uh, municipalities to issue debt beyond that. And in fact, much of the debt that is allowed by the general laws is by its, by law, exempt in any case. For example, uh, many water purposes are exempt from the debt limit, and then uh, school projects that are funded by the Massachusetts School Building Authority, those are uh, exempt from the 5% debt limit. Uh, bond Council for the town is currently Lock Lord, and they review federal and state legal issues for the town for its financing. Now, I'm gonna move on to funding sources. Um, for its various bonds and notes, the town has uh, the general fund, both within Proposition 2 and a half, and then excluded from Proposition 2 and a half. I would look at those as two separate funding sources. Um, the Community Preservation Fund is another source of financing for debt finance projects. And then enterprise funds, which the town of Amherst uses uh, quite a bit in uh, financing uh, its water and sewer, well, actually that's how the financial operations of the water and sewer utilities are operated as enterprise funds, and those are the those enterprise fund revenues are the source of revenue uh, in the first instance for um, debt for those purposes. Um, now, all of this operates within the capital markets. Now, what are the capital markets? The it's you. The question is, who lends funds to a community like Amherst or other organizations? I mean. AT&T or any, just about any corporate or um, other kind of entity, uh, governmental entity, will have occasion to borrow money. Um, there are commercial banks that generally buy and hold the debt. Um, in fact, the town is gonna to be taking bids on a $1.39 million bond anticipation note uh, on Thursday, and that likely is going to be purchased by a buy and hold lender. Uh, so that's a, in all likelihood. The other types of banks are the investment banks, the JP Morgans, the uh, Fidelity uh, Capital Markets. These uh, types of investment banks often reoffer securities to purchasers of all shapes and sizes. Now, um, another major participant in the capital markets set of participants are the rating agencies, S&P Global Ratings, the town uh, has had a rating with S&P for about 10 years. Currently, that rating is AA plus the next highest rating, as Mr. Sherman uh, alluded before. 
Uh, Moody's Investor Service is the other major uh, rating agency. Now, uh, municipal advisor, we, that would be our role, uh, Unibank Fiscal Advisory Services. We advise the town on debt and capital issues, and we work with you uh, basically every step of the way, and I have a uh, long history with the town, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy and pleased to have that history, um, but we are currently your municipal advisor. Now, um, S&P Global Ratings. Um, we we'll talk about how issuers like the town interact with S&P. Um, and, I, and I think that you have the most recent uh, rating report, which is actually now about four years old, uh, as well as the updated methodology that uh, S&P Global Ratings uses. So the way that this starts is that the uh, management of the town will uh, interact with analysts, rating analysts of S&P Global Ratings. Those analysts will review um, audited financial statements, other disclosure information, and other sources of information. And then there will be some sort of meeting or call with the management, including uh, us, um, in advance of a rating. In general, um, the town would be asking for a rating with a major financing, either a large uh, note issue or a bond issue. Uh, this is why the town hasn't sought a rating in about four years. That's the last time that the town actually issued general obligation bonds. After that process is completed, analysts then go to a rating committee, which then makes the decision on what the rating is. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman. Can we pause for a moment and see if there are any questions that have arisen? so far, or would you prefer to go all the way through and handle questions at the end? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's your pleasure. See if there are any questions that have arisen so far then. I have some, but let's just keep going. Well, Kathy has I, one. I can, I just, on, when you went through the different kinds of uh, going out with a bond, like in terms of an, an anticipatory note, would you yes. normally go out fairly short term for that, because then you're going out for the longer term? Right. Well, I think that it's, it depends on the strategy. There are a couple of factors that will go into that. <clears throat> Last few years, the town has actually issued on a, um, about an annual basis those bond anticipation notes. Uh, one advantage has been that short-term rates have been very low. It also makes sense in terms of um, the, you know, if the amount of spending for the capital projects is still uncertain, um, it's a way to uh, be a little bit flexible about what is being financed. And then it also is a matter of the size of the borrowing. You, uh, one would want to see um, sort of a critical mass for the size of a, a bond issue. So those would all be reasons, um, maybe not in the past four years of equal importance, but those would be reasons why uh, a town like Amherst would issue bond anticipation notes. How often do we go out for a bond rating, um, for our S&P rating? Well, the last time was um, January of 2015, which is the last time that the town issued long-term bonds. Okay. Uh, I would expect that one of two things will happen in the next year. Uh, it's possible that, uh, and I'll defer to the management of the town, but if the town were to issue bonds uh, in, say, in the next year, then I would expect that um, the town would apply for a rating. It is also possible that uh, S&P could call either Sherry or Paul or me and say, we want to do a surveillance call. And uh, so they, they would um, arrange a time to uh, sit with us uh, either on the phone or in person and review where the town is. Um, so I would say that within the next year, either the town will apply for a rating for, with, in connection with a new issuance of bonds, or there will be a surveillance of the existing rating. Is it better to, I make an assumption, but I'll ask it as a question. Is it better to do that rating when you are at a very low level of borrowing? Well, I, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the, the you, it's, what you want to do is you want to get a rating when, in order to 
make a financing as marketable and as efficient as possible. Um, whether or not uh, debt levels are high, I mean, debt is, and as I'll go, I'll talk about it in a little bit, debt is only one factor, the level of debt is only one factor that the rating agencies look at. Um, it's, uh, I mean, less debt may make a community stronger, but um, it's not the only factor, and it is only, in this case, in S&P's case, it's 10% of the rating, so it's not, it's not even a majority of, okay. the, of the score here. Mr. Chairman, I'll... Just looking around to see if there's anything else. Thank you. Okay. I guess proceed. Um, now, I'm going to talk about how does S&P Global Ratings look at local governments, and this methodology was implemented um, a little over five years ago, September of 2013. And in fact, when the town got its rating in early calendar 2014, the town, town's rating was upgraded as a result of this uh, um, new methodology. And for each of the credit categories, the scoring reads as very strong, strong, adequate, weak, or very weak. And what the uh, rating agencies do is come up with, what this rating agency does, I should say, S&P Global Ratings, um, arrives at an in initial indicative score. The categories are finances, and within finances, reserves, um, which you would think of as free cash and stabilization fund would be the primary ones. Uh, surpluses and deficits in a, in a given year is the, is the town um, may, you know, adding to free cash and stabilization, or is it taking away on a net basis? Cash position, what does your liquidity look like at June 30th? And then debt and other liabilities, and actually this category looks at some of the issues that Mr. Sherman raised in his presentation. Um, the economy, tax base and income, 30%. And for Amherst, it's, it's kind of an unusual case because um, because of your 35,000 residents, something like 20,000 of them are between the ages of 18 and 22, that has a significant distorting effect on the income measures. And, um, and also the, the fact that you have a major, uh, some major tax-exempt institutions in the tax base also distorts. Um, but the but S and P does recognize and make adjustments, especially in Amherst's case, uh, for this issue. Um, management twenty percent. That is not um, based on the biographies or the personalities of your individual managers. This is based on poli written policies and procedures, uh, and whether those policies and procedures are followed in the areas of um, reporting on revenues and expenditures. Um, methods of budgeting, um, policies on reserves and liquidity, um, investment policies, debt policies. Do you have a capital plan, which Amherst is, uh, is a very um, robust capital plan. And, and lastly, uh, revenue and expenditure operating forecasting. Now the last uh, area that they look at is what's called institutional factors. And this is a statewide legal and regulatory examination all uh, municipalities within a state get this rating, uh, get this, that this score in Massachusetts, it is strong, the second, second highest score. And this is 10% of the total uh, initial score. And then there are various adjustments that uh, are made by the analysts and by rating committee as they deliberate on the rating. I just pause for a second on the prior slide to point something out to um, other members of the council who are here. Um, the management, the 20%, <clears throat> my recollection in having worked with um, our former town manager and finance director, John Misanti, he recognized, I think, that that was one that we could have a substantial effect on ourselves. And um, when he worked very hard as a finance director to help us to develop 
the management policies and objectives, which are a written set of policies that we could then follow. Uh, the, the creation of those policies was a very deliberate action on his part to encourage us in the direction. Um, I'm assuming that under economy, because so much <coughs> of our land is education and therefore not taxed, hurts us. Well, it's um, actually, I, I'll, I'm going to give away what the score, the last time the score was actually strong, which we had to kind of, you know, with Sandy Pooler um, was finance director at the time, we really pulled out all the stops to make that case. They, you know, we started with the fact that the income figures are below average and the fact that tax base per capita is also below average, but also recognizing that Amherst is part of a, um, a broad and diverse economy and also has stabilizing institutions. The university, the colleges are considered to be stabilizing institutions. And I believe the latter was explicitly cited as a, as a positive adjustment in that score. So um, to say that those hurt Amherst is, um, I mean, certainly that's where we start when we um, talk to the rating agencies, and we're very aware of where, where that starts, but it isn't necessarily where it ends. So the fact that, for example, one of those institutions is very well endowed, and another of those institutions is funded by the full faith of the Commonwealth, helps us. Well, the fact that they are very stable, and in fact, I'll, I'll make a sort of off, um, I'll, I'll make a comment. In the years that I've worked in Amherst, and I work with some of the surrounding communities as well, the observation I make is that the valley is all but recession proof. Um, Eastern Massachusetts can go through a recession, and that actually that has an effect on Amherst in terms of revenues. You may, you may have your state aid may be um, put in jeopardy because of what's happening in Boston and the Boston area. But over 15 years at least, uh, one can observe with the business cycle that uh, the Amherst, Hadley, Northampton, that corridor has consistently been pretty strong economically, especially as you look at unemployment rates and similar uh, data. Although parts of Western Mass don't have that same. Oh, you don't have to go very far in, we in Western and Central Mass, uh, and it is pretty remarkable. I'll, I'll agree with you uh, that you don't have to go very far to find something very different. Dorothy. Dorothy. Could you talk? Could you talk a little bit more about cash position, um, reserves, and liquidity? Just expand on what you mean there. Well, what the technical examination that uh, S&P does is they look at total cash in the audited financials as of June 30th, and they actually look at enterprise fund cash as well as general fund cash. But they then compare that to total expenditures in what are called governmental funds, which is not just the general fund of the town, but it includes other well, so-called governmental funds, the community preservation fund, um, certain special revenue funds. Um, so then they take, they, they compare the cash position to uh, expenditures and also to total debt service that's paid out of governmental funds, and um, then come up with a metric to um, say how strong the town's cash position is. And uh, actually, I might as well, what I might as well do is go forward to what the scores were uh, at least four years ago. Mm -hmm. do, just go ahead to there um, and just say that uh, the reserves four years ago were strong. Uh, surpluses, the budgetary performances, strong. Liquidity, cash, very strong. Debt was very strong, although I'm going to, I should asterisk that. And I don't know if Mr. Sherman is, I guess he's not still here, but pension and OPEB uh, was somewhat of a concern then, maybe cont may continue to be a concern. Um, generally in Massachusetts, S&P particularly, 
is concerned about the impact of pension and OPEP on the operations of municipalities. Um, last time, with the last rating, the combined total of the Hampshire County retirement assessment plus the uh, pay, pay as you go OPEB cost was 9% of governmental expenditures, and that was fiscal year 2014. And S&P looks at a 10%, if you're 10% or above, that raises a red flag. So, I, you know, uh, back of the envelope for 2018, the most recent audited financials, it's a little bit lower, <coughs> uh, it's more towards 8%. But still, it's on, the, it's on the high side. And if there were anything that was going to prevent upward movement in the rating, that might be it. And, the, and any time that I speak with the analysts at S&P, they'll say, in Massachusetts, we are concerned about pension and OPEP, and particularly for those communities where those uh, percentages are higher. So, um, but debt at the time, in 2015, was very low. It continues to be low right now. I know that uh, you and other stakeholders in the community are looking at capital projects, which could change that. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about that. But um, the score was very strong. I'm going to go to the. So the economy, as I said before, was rated, the scored strong, which took, you know, the raw scores are weak, but I think that they were able to see the mitigating effect of uh, various, uh, of the presence of the very stable employers and participation in a very vibrant regional economy as being offsetting, uh, benefiting factors. Well, and, and I would think they're, they're looking, I mean, S&P is looking across the country. So they've got municipalities that are one company towns um, and destabilizing GE or destabilizing an industry will sink. As you said, we're, we're more protected against those. Um, well, I think that there are a number, you know, yeah. I think that the, um, I'll say that just the stability of the employers yep. and yep. The, um, the fact that, you know, you have a very, you know, a vibrant economy beyond the borders of Amherst that, you know, people can commute to the Springfield area, the Hartford area, and places further away, that those factors do help. Um, so that's how the, the town got a strong economy score. Management uh, and the, ch the chair spoke about uh, the efforts, and I would mention both uh, John um, and uh, Sandy Pooler as having uh, been, laid the groundwork um, for the policies and procedures that got the town to that very strong score back in 2015. And then uh, this, the score then and now for institutional has been strong. So, Mr. Chairman, this might actually be a good time for me to pause for a moment to see if there are any other questions. Oh, see any. Okay. So thank you. So as of today, the town has $13.3 million worth of debt, about $10.2 million in long-term debt, of which $8.1 is enterprise support, either water or sewer, and $2.1 is uh, general fund supported. And the town currently pays its debt very fast. Um, more than half of the debt will be paid uh, by the end of fiscal year 24, over 80% by 2029. So right now, these are very, really strong debt numbers. Does that bottom numbers that you had on there include the debt for the enterprise funds? Is that across yes. the board? Okay. Yes. Okay. So I alluded to um, short-term debt. Um, town renewed $3.155 million fairly recently and is going to be issuing about actually a little bit less than the 1.4 million shortly, taking bids on Thursday. Uh, the town has about 9.1 million currently in authorized and issued debt, 
4 million of which is for sewer, 2.8 million of which is for water, and 2.3 million of which is for general purposes. Now, um, what for general fund, what does authorized unissue, what does it literally mean? I mean, that we peg a number with some ideas of what we're going to be spending it on? Well, it means that, well, in the case, uh, I don't believe that the town council has authorized any debt yet. So right. this would be debt that the town meeting, when there was still a town meeting, authorized and that the town has not borrowed against yet. So it's available, it's authorization that's available to be borrowed, but it hasn't been borrowed yet. Or it may, it may actually include the short term. I should say it does include the short term debt, but it, does, it would not include the long term debt. I need to have you go back over that again. Yep. So it may include the slide before. So our total debt is 13.3. Right. Of, and that's long term and long term. Long term is about 10.2, so there's about 3.2. You know, the 3.155 that's short term. And these, uh, the 9.1 that's authorized on issued includes the, the two numbers above, the 3.155 and the 1.4. Those will convert to issued debt when the town issues long term debt for those purposes. Um, I'm curious, I mean, sewer and water, it's kind of like. You have to just keep on maintaining stuff. On the general debt that's been authorized, um, Paul, can you give us a little more background on that? I mean, that includes things like um, a crosswalk at the Amity, uh, the Amity crosswalk and parking lot. Um, I think what else? Uh, so, so it's things, it may be projects that we have on short term mm -hmm. debt that we haven't rolled over. Uh, or things that town meeting has authorized, said we were willing to borrow money, but we haven't actually borrowed it or even done the project yet to take that on. I can't, examples? Yeah, and I think, I think some of the CPA projects, some of the purchases of land would be considered general fund, even That's... though they're supported by CPA. Um, there's a boiler at the Wildwood School. Yeah. There's planning for the Fort River School. Though that would be included in the 2.3 million in authorized and issued debt because it's, it may be outstanding in short-term notes, but it's not issued as long-term debt at this point. Thank you. Soon. Okay. Um, it might be in the numbers that you have, but in um, the end of the year when I have to record it for the uh, Division of Local Services, I do include any short-term debt that's been issued as authorized and issued. Right. So it's any authorization that the town meeting had made in the past. If they authorized two million for the sewer fund, it would sit there as as unissued until we actually borrowed funds for that. And then whatever portion we issued that year would come off that balance. So um, I haven't ha I didn't verify these numbers. They're close to what we have. General fund debt is uh, the parking lot. Our Peg, we haven't we haven't issued any money for Peg yet, so that's still unauthorized. Right. But and they and they're not to confuse matters, but the some of the reports that the controller will file might treat because the Department of Revenue might look at things a little bit differently than how uh, if we are preparing a disclosure document for the capital markets, they we would treat them treat these matters a little bit differently. I think and this. They, we're get to the, we get to the same numbers, but I think they, there's a somewhat different perspective. And uh, I mean, if you want to get into the weeds here, we can do that, but it's, uh, it's really just a different way of uh, stating uh, the same information. Do we just for keep adding to the ceiling for sewer and water so that it's, you know, we spend it down or we go out and get authorized debt, and then well, we might have to do more? Well, water and sewer can sometimes be bar authorized outside the debt limit, so it doesn't go against that. Okay. Right, and, and water almost always, this 2.8 million almost, almost certainly is outside the debt limit. And the town has been making 
principal paydowns over the past few years on these series, you know, since 2016, a uh, series of short-term notes, the town has been making principal payments and actually reducing the amount of uh, indebtedness because once you pay principal, that does, that reduces the authorization as well as the amount of debt, the short-term debt that's outstanding. So at the time the unit, at the time that interest rates really dipped, um, which, you know, they're still low, compared to, to years ago. Did we do any refinancing of our debt to take advantage of those interest rates? Yes. Yes. Um, and I am, I will have to get back to you about when that was done. I want to say in 2014, but I'm, I, I, would, I would get back to um, management here and I can, through them, I can get you an answer to that. I mean, I worked on, I know I've worked on, actually over the past uh, few decades, a number of refinancings when interest rates have been favorable. Um, and the fact is that the strategy that the town has used since 2016 has taken advantage of very low short-term interest rates. Um, and actually we may be heading back, those rates may be heading back down a little bit at this point. So, um, you know, we'll see going forward where, where that goes. But um, certainly, we would be looking at opportunities to uh, help the town save some money through debt service. Just want to point out one other thing. So, um, the part, the largest part of our general fund debt is actually for some um, bands we took out for road repairs. I think we took out four million a couple years ago, so we're still paying that back. So that's yeah, and the, and the numbers are lower than the four million because the town has been paying down that principal along all along, um, so that's that's why the numbers appear to be less than that four million dollars. <coughs> okay, so. Um, the town authorizes debt at this point. It's you folks. Two-thirds vote of the town council authorizes debt. Before the council was impaneled, it was two-thirds vote of town meeting. Uh, now, excluded debt is a majority vote at a, an election of the voters. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind if you are looking at debt exclusions, that that is a, a ballot at an election rather than a vote of the town council. To we as a town council, if we're going to exclude a debt, do we first take a vote and does it have to be a two-thirds vote to go to excluded debt? I would have to check with bond council, but I believe the rule would be a majority. I will check that and get back, but I believe it's a majority vote of the council to place uh, a question on the ballot, but I can get back to you on exactly what the procedure yeah. is. I think the... the from our experience of just what we went through, um, a majority of the vote of the council, as previously majority of the vote of the select board, would allow it to be presented to the voters, which would then authorize the debt by a majority vote, but would still need to issue the bonds. And the, the issuance of the bonds is different from authorizing the debt. And that required two thirds. And that's, Andy, that's why I just asked about the first step. Did we also have to have to even go to the voters? So you're it, thinking it was a majority. And I have looked at that recently mm -hmm. to double check my memory on it. So just to make sure we, because this <coughs> is a big issue, we authorized by a majority to put it on the ballot. Well, it's actually for, the, for any debt, it's a two thirds vote of the council. So to authorize any debt, including excluded debt, there first has to be a two-thirds vote of the council. If then the, the desire is to exclude the debt service on that debt from the limits of Proposition 2 and a half, then a majority vote of the council can authorize a ballot vote, which would pass with a majority uh, at, at an election of the voters. And then does it come back to the council and require a two-thirds? Well, you need the two-thirds just to authorize the debt in the first place. 
you need, it's, two, it's a two-step process. So all debt, okay. think of all debt is, you know, the, the, the universe of all debt that the town of Amherst would be issuing would require a two-thirds vote of the council. The subset of that debt that is excluded from Proposition 2 and a half, then in addition to the two-thirds vote authorizing the debt, also requires a majority vote of the council to place a ballot question before the voters that if, if approved by a majority voting would then exclude the debt service from the limits of Proposition 2 and a half. But I think the one additional thing to note, because I went into this before we authorized the, the override vote for the school um, last time, communities have the option to either authorize the debt before or after a debt exclusion override. Um, and that is a um, totally a local decision to be made, but at some point, the two-thirds requirement. Um, when uh, decisions were made about which order to take it in in the last round, it was a question of deciding whether it was better to get the guidance from the voters before going to town meeting or after going to town meeting. So in that case, the select board authorized, they took it out to the vote, the vote was a majority, and then town meeting failed to do the two-thirds. That's correct. Okay. And uh, That's the other thing that I um, found as I was looking into it during that period of time is that probably a majority of the communities do it the order of authorizing the debt and then going for the debt exclusion override. It's, um, that that's more common but not required by the Commonwealth. I believe you're correct, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. That's useful. Okay. Um, I think uh, if there aren't any other questions about this question, the last slide is basically, and I understand that um, a group of projects that may total $100 million is under consideration uh, in the town of Amherst, and the question is, what effect does this have on the town, and I think my quest, my answer is it depends. Uh, it depends <laughs> on the timing, um, you know, how you, how and when it is authorized. Do you authorize it all at once? Do you uh, authorize this, um, you know, once every few years? Uh, take a project every once every few years. Um, it depends on when you'd be scheduling construction, because the um, the thing that's going to drive Financing is the need to pay contractors. You know when you know whether it's a short-term financing or a long-term financing. Those um, uh, that timing and those amounts that are borrowed are driven by what the town needs to cover uh, for uh, for, the, for its contractors that are doing the work on the projects, and then how financing is timed, how it's structured. That those considerations could have an effect on how um, the bond ratings, how the bond rating agency, uh, agencies and the capital markets in general would look at the, uh, at this, uh, at this capital program. Um, Kathy? So I, um, can I, I, this is what I think I heard. So say we went out initially for 30 million or 40 million first big project. Um, if the bond agencies did not know we had another 60, we might stay with a higher I, I rating. I wouldn't necessarily advise not telling them. No, no, but it, you know, no, but no, no, but it, 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 they would first consider that, and then might be the spread. But I'm wondering whether the interest rate and the rating we might get on each of the bonds when we went out would vary. They depending. could. They so it could. Well. So we could go out with a very good rating, but as we start to get to the higher debt load, we could be facing mm -hmm. a higher interest rate because the rating changed. Is what I'm looking at. I don't point. know that. I, I think the rating itself is likely to be more stable. You know, okay. unless we see a real pressure on or or positive pressure on credit factors. Uh, it, I mean, the, that's possible too. I think the, you know, the. Double A plus rating. There's only one 
notch higher that the town could, where the town could go, and that's AAA. Um, you know, there are, the town could potentially go down, but that's, I don't, I think that the rating in general is going to be more stable. What's harder to predict, uh, more of an art and a science, is what do we think interest rates are going to be going forward, especially as we get years into the future. That's a really speculative uh, exercise, uh, something that I do, will do, have done uh, for the town, but it's, it's speculative, and I think the changes in capital market conditions could have much more of an effect on what those interest rates are than any given change in the rating. That's helpful. That was, and I didn't mean not saying the larger amount. I meant more staging it over time as, as right. we loading up. Yeah. I think that if it, I think if the town presents a thoughtful plan to and can make the argument about how just how that plan is going to be executed, how it's going to be paid, what the effects on tax rates, enterprise funds, budgets, what those effects are going to be, really project that out, then I think that, that the, the rating agencies would see that at least as not negative and possibly a, a real positive. So funding source is a, uh, an issue. I mean, enterprise fund debt, as long as it is self Supporting doesn't count towards the scores that S&P Global Ratings uses to look at debt. Uh, with a recent um, rating presentation that uh, I was involved with, a uh, town of uh, probably reasonably similar size to Amherst um, was issuing uh, $13 million in bonds, $8 million in bans, all governmental funds. But then recently it had issued a major, pro had done a major project for a wastewater treatment facility. And we went to great lengths to demonstrate that this financing for the wastewater treatment facility, which was going to be in excess of $40 million, would not count towards the debt scores. We made sure that we nailed down that this, this was not going to count towards the town's debt. So that's, that sort of thing matters here. Um, and then, you know, the f future and credit, current credit conditions, you know, the size of operations, the uh, S&P Global Ratings looks at how big, I mean, you, governmental funds here are $85 million, roughly speaking, and that probably will grow over a number of years, but that's something to sort of keep in mind. Uh, that's right from the audited financials. Tax base and wealth, um, you know, notice that there has been development in, in Amherst Center in recent years that probably is adding to the tax base some. Um, we'd want to see uh, effects on financial operations. I mentioned inside the levy limit debt, what is, what is that impact going to be on operating budgets? That's something that needs to be carefully considered. Now, I think the mechanism that is in place does that uh, very well, but it's, I think you're going to see <coughs> the need to really apply that, and I th I'm sure that it will be really applied uh, with uh, any major proposed projects. And then one thought about uh, excluded debt is if, and this isn't necessarily to say that this would be a concern except with a very, very large project, but would a, could a, uh, a debt excluded project affect collection rates, property tax collection rates? That's at least something with a really large project to, th to at least ask the question, does that affect uh, your collection rates. Even if you're able to levy the, uh, the dollars, are you, are you going to be able to collect them? And then other liabilities. We talked about pension, OPEB, plans for the regional school district. You know, what, what debt that they may have um, going forward. I think that that's going to have to be considered as well. So uh, I hope that this is useful to you. Yeah. It is. It is very helpful. I wanted to turn back to something you said way back at slide seven, and um, that was where you were talking about the 5% of EQV um, limits amount. And you said, as I understood it, there was some special rule that applied to MSBA. Well, MSBA supported debt is outside the, the, uh, the 5% debt limit. That's, it's not counted against the 5% debt limit. 
Any the the portion that's paid by the town uh, is not is not counted against them. that. So that's huge. Oh, that's big. Yeah, I I I'm I'm sure of that. That's it's, no, I don't. So we that wasn't noticed. Essentially, the sheet. I I, I, I want to go back to this really because this is this is like news to us. Right. So hypothetically, we build a new elementary school. Right. Hypothetically, it's an $80 million school. Right. Hypothetically, we get $40 million from the MSBA. Right. Our $40 million that we go out and the citizens approve? Will not count against the 5% the debt limit. Wow. But that's not, I think, I want to emphasize the debt limit is, is purely a legal issue. Yeah. It doesn't, I think, probably higher in your minds, further, you know, closer in should be what are the credit implications, what are the effects on operations of issuing this debt. Right. Uh, I think this, lead, you know, this is sort of a, uh, a sort of a, an initial hurdle that, you, that the town would have to pass is does the town legally have the ability to authorize and issue the debt? But I don't think that's the end of the story. Even if the town, if that 40 million doesn't count uh, against the 5% EQV limit, um, that's still, um, that's not the end of the story. And the analysis that we would have to help the town do is what effect does this have on tax rates or budgets, collection rates, all of the other issues that affect the operations of the town. Oh, so I think that's the that's the key point is there is that legal limit, but more than that, I think the ratings agencies are looking at your debt overall and the plan for debt over time. And I think one of the things that's important to remember is that ratings agencies don't, from my experience, don't look for no debt. They want communities to be investing in their infrastructure and their built in, built environment. That's a good sign. That's a healthy sign that you are investing. Uh, but they want it to be managed. And I think a lot of what David is saying is, is about, it's about management. Do you know how you're managing your resources? Do you have the resources to, to pay off things that you take on? The other problem, the other challenge we have is that sometimes things are outside our control. Uh, the state economy the, and those things, we, those are things that we, we have a micro economy here, but they are also, we're overlaid with a state economy and with a federal uh, economy and with a world economy and the, all those things get factored into the rating right. that we get. Fortunately, we're in a, a strong state that has a good reputation for management, uh, for municipal management. We're at the upper tier of municipal management. So I think we're, the things that we can control, we do pretty well on. There's some things that we don't control. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I hear that and you know, even in the recent our most recent recession, Massachusetts fared better than just about any other state in the nation. But so the model, this is not your question, but the model we've been looking at has assumed that the debt is part of our ceiling. Yeah, so it may have been a miscommunication between myself and David. So I sent the model for David to take a look at mm -hmm. with the projects included. Um, and maybe it wasn't clear that one of the projects was a MSBA school funded project. Um, but that's news to me that that's not, um, that that's not subject to the debt ceiling so we can adjust the model to include that. I, I, again, I'm not ignoring Paul's caution and your caution, David. Just, you know, it's whether our taxpayers will bear it is a whole big issue and then lots of other yeah. issues as well, but. Right, but I think these are separate issues. The, as I said, this, this legal uh, issue is kind of a sort of a minimum threshold. It's a yeah. threshold issue. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry if there was a yeah. miscommunication there, but um, the, uh, um, the school, um, you know, that, that's considered to be pure, whether it's excluded from proposition two and a half. And one thing actually um, I did clarify with um, um, bond council today, and this is an, an, a limit that you should be also aware of is that the, the $25 per thousand primary limit or levy ceiling 
is not limited by a debt exclusion. You can, you can pay debt service above and beyond that level. Not that that's a desirable thing to do, but so that, that, that is a, that's something to be aware of is that that's. Is that two and a half? Uh, yeah, the 20, that's in two and a half. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah, so the two and a half limit, uh, you know, and you know, Rick Manley is one is a is an expert, and he, you know, he, he and I were talking about this, and it, you know, we clarified that it is in fact a, a debt ex, debt excluded debt service can be can raise the tax rate above that twenty five dollars per thousand. Not that Amherst is in any danger currently of that. Other communities not too far away are, but um, that's something also to keep in the back of our minds. In addition, you know, we're talking about the 5% EQV limit, but the uh, levy limit is another issue to keep in mind as well. I think as uh, people who run for public office, but even before I ran for public office, we're all aware of the fact that a lot of people are on fixed incomes or otherwise struggling to meet their property tax obligations and that as elected officials, that's where we have an obligation to weigh needs versus sensitivity towards the taxpayers and the community who are our constituents. So other Discussion, questions, comments? Paul? Just a, just a last thing. I just want to you know, recognize that our treasurer and collector, Jen and Sherry, are here as well. We rely a lot on David. This is, I thought this was an excellent presentation. I really appreciated it. Uh, you sort of walked us through a lot of the very detailed, complex things in a very understandable way. And he's been working with the town for decades. Um, before almost everybody except Sherry has been here, I think. <laughs> I worked um, with uh, Nancy Maglione and Norma Lynch. So he, knows, so, so, so he knows us well. He knows our operations. It's, it's a relief to be able to talk to someone who's there's no ramp up in understanding us, and he knows all the elements of it. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, um, I guess the question, I'll turn, I'm going to turn it back over to the president because I don't know if there are other things you wanted to cover from the council-wide perspective. And it's since it's a special meeting, we don't require public comment, but you'll come back to that later because your finance committee does require it. Um, correct? Yes. Okay. Is there anything else from the council at this time? This really covers our two agenda items. Uh, and you're welcome to stay for the rest of the finance committee uh, discussion uh, where we will get into. No, just stay where you, stay where you are. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Uh, OK, so given this, what I would like to do is I have a motion to adjourn the special meeting of the town council. And a second. Evan is the second, and all those in favor? And that's unanimous. So we'll now take a break, if you don't mind, Andy. Okay. okay. And uh, as we um, get to the break, just so that members of the council who are here, uh, one other discussion item that we're going to have very quickly is on um, something that we were charged to do, which was to think about the qualifications that we would be looking for for resident members of the Finance Committee, so that you're aware that that's a, a discussion item that's coming up very quickly. So with that, I think we'll take a five minute recess. Okay, so shall we reconvene the Finance Committee meeting after the recess and uh, I don't know if there's any um, the major additional item that we want to talk about I previously identified as the criteria for uh, resident members of the Finance Committee. I don't know if there was any public comment um, on any subject, so this would be the answer is, seems to be no. So thank you. Uh, so. Uh,
If you didn't get an email I sent earlier in the afternoon, I wanted to send that, pass out a few copies. I had mine. Uh, I didn't. I've been in a meeting all day. So I suggested um, one additional question, which is number five and therefore underlined. Everything else is just oh, putting nice. in the numbering questions. That's nice. Um, so I want to turn to the rest of you then to see if there are any um, additional questions or rewording of questions, uh, concerns cool. about questions, whatever. I guess I'm taking notes. Yep. Okay. You, um, you. All right. I will try to do both because I do have some, some things I wanted to mention or discuss here. Um, when you say in the, under the qualifications, experience serving on finance committees in Amherst, to me that means on the finance committee of town meeting. Is that what you mean? Yes, that, I, I, that's what I wrote and it should, could be rephrased, Lynn, to be specific. And I, I just, actually I, object to that. Okay, because that narrows the pool dramatically. And I would like to make sure that like we did with the ECAC, we say among the group, there might be some of, with that kind of experience. But to lead with it almost as being a qualification that you have to have done that suggests to me don't bother to apply unless you've oh, been on the finance committee oh, I, in the past. So when I drafted it, I didn't mean to, whoops. These should, I understand what you're saying. This was among the, ex, among the experience. Among the candidates. Yes. I think forget. the problem is that it's too close to the other mic. I, I didn't, that's, that's a drafting problem. There certainly didn't mean that that is, you have to have that. So experience. Experiences of interest include, or some, it was supposed to be, ideally, we wouldn't get people who were just with an Amherst experience. I was hoping we get some from beyond Amherst, some others, so any kind of wording that would reword that, that it wouldn't be just an Amherst experience. So I just meant included among the experiences that would be of interest are the following. Because I'd take someone who knew a lot about X, Y, or Z who had never been on a finance. I didn't mean it to be excluding. I, th I think you should say can include, which I think is the word from the other committee, as opposed to include. Can, I think that was something like that. I, uh, can include. Okay. Um, finance committees. Do you want to say finance committees in Am Amherst or elsewhere? Yes, this was again poorly drafted because that first whole clause would be a finance committee in Amherst in any other public body or any private body. So I, I just meant any kind of finance committee. <laughs> that would be one of the things that would be of interest. And then if you didn't have that, you know, so I was trying to do these are, here are some of the kinds of things that would be of interest. So people should literally give me better wording on this. It was not supposed to be, you have to have one from each bucket. The other thing that I, again, I'm going back to the uh, presentations we had today, and unless there's other experience in this group that I'm not aware of, which certainly could be possible, if we happen to find somebody that had experience with actuarials and bonding, it would actually enhance the committee's knowledge. So would it be helpful, I'm writing that down, I could put qualifications, I, I may include any of the following, and then bullet, 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 bullet. So first is experience on other committees, train your experience, then add actuarial. 
So it's so accounting, actuarial. I, I don't think we need to finish because we're meeting on when, on when Thursday. Are we meeting Thursday this week? Are we meeting on Thursday? No, I guess not. Not no, until that's not until next. But we yeah. are meeting before the next council meeting. So maybe the best thing to do today is to take some suggestions and um, draft with it. But uh, Dorothy and I think we're pretty much, I don't want to speak for Dorothy, but basically saying the experience can include this, but it doesn't have to include this. I just want to, to make sure that it doesn't sound like a, a job application. It's, it's sounding a little bit too much like that, the kind that we get, we get posted on you know, the HCC job list. And people often do think they have to fill in, you know, put a check next to each thing. Um, there should be something not quite so specific. These are awfully job specific. It's like saying you have to know these three kinds of software or whatever. That's an interesting point, and I think is maybe, let me rephrase it and see if I have it wrong, um, just to, and that is, are we looking for people with experience, solely looking for people with experience in financial management, or are we looking for anyone from the town who is able to also assist us with the general questions of what are the priorities of the community as far as financial matters? Uh, getting back to the prior discussion, weighing the, the importance of doing capital investments versus um, the concerns about the effect on ability to pay taxes. And, and this is, again, I go back to our experience with ECAC and our, and, and what we tried to do was strike something that basically said, there's just regular old Joe and Mary citizens on this committee who know how to ask good questions and represent the voters. You don't want people to say, I should be paid for this. But that's true for all boards and committees of the entire town. And we have at times over the course of, because of legal or practical requirements required people to have certain kinds of expertise, planning board, for example, um, or the uh, historic district commission requires somebody who has architecture experience. But that but that's one person. In other words, th th many of those committees, it sounds like somebody from this, somebody from that, somebody from there, but not somebody with all of these things. That was the intent of this. That's why I was thinking maybe a bullet list that any of the following, because it, it, it was, at least in my mind, yeah. if we get three people, it would be great to have them be different from each other. You know, that one is bringing something and someone else is bringing something else so we get a rich addition of three people and I don't know what that might be you know I'm just saying that they don't all have exact they don't all have the same background experience as each other but do we need to say that explicitly because I think that this is where we get into the problem that the interview screening is no longer being um, suggested to be a member of the finance committee. That has not been solved. That, that has still been delayed as a vote in the council. We delayed it again last night. So I think that that's really what The more that the, that the committee has a direct role in the process, then you, 
the less clear you have to be, but if we're not going to have that direct role, which is an undecided issue, there is a need to be clear. Exactly. I also noticed with the Climate Committee, uh, there may have been applicants that had none of the above, you know, in terms of the long list, but we got people that were fantastic that had many of the above and that were different, you know, so, so the richness of the pool will also help us figure out what we, what, well, what the mix could be. So one of the possibilities is to take the sentence that we've been looking at and say across the pool, comma, the qualifications of members might include, and I would just say experience serving on finance committees yep. and not say even in Amherst. Fine. Actually, I was wondering about even more broad knowledge about municipal or government finance, um, mm -hmm. yeah. and then say mm -hmm. giving possibilities. I'm thinking about somebody who happens to be uh, a resident of Amherst. Just first sentence does say that. I just didn't put it in the list then, because we actually put that in our right. charge. Mm -hmm. So. Preference should be given to applicants with experience, skills, or knowledge of finance, tax, or policy issues, right. including municipal finance was an overall. Maybe. Yes, go on. About preference should be, again, that makes it sound like you, you're excluding somebody in the general public who it just knows the residents of Amherst and knows what their limits are. But could we just strike the first sentence and just start with qualifications, colon, across the pool, the qualifications of the members might include experience serving on finance committees, et cetera. And, in, and I, love, I love the last place where you say including knowledge beyond Amherst. I would say, even say knowledge of Amherst and beyond Amherst. I would say that, yes, definitely. It was useful hearing some of the, uh, the, the uh, our experts talking about how some of the towns in Massachusetts have dealt with various problems. That's why it's interesting. So, Pat. You do. So you just say something like serving on finance committees. No, I, I actually didn't take notes just in the last one. I was just looking at the charge. The charge that we approved last night says selection of resident members shall be based on relevant experience, skills, and policy knowledge with an emphasis on municipal and public finance. I like that. General. So I like the word policy in there. So it's, not it's not just isolated skills, but uh, it's people are going to be trying to make decisions for the town. So 
could I just copy and paste that sentence as the first sentence yes. and then do this yes. qual qualities, uh, among other qualities, might include? <laughs> I, I said across the pool. Across the pool. Or across the appointees, the qualifications of the members might, in may in might include. Might include, okay. Other thoughts? Um, because I, I guess that my thought would be um, the knowledge that they bring may be important, but um, it doesn't need. It certainly would be helpful if they had the experience. We would want to know that, but um, it, I don't think that it's an exclusive, and that's what we're trying to get at. We don't want to make it be that we end up with people who all have one set of particular qualifications to the exclusion of all others. So the we should say might include a, a range such as to mean you don't have to have everything. Or not everyone that has to have everything right. either. And, and frankly, maybe somebody doesn't even have that. And again, we go back to ECAC where at least one or two people are really there because they're strong advocates. It's not because they know how to do retrofitting. Okay. So we're gonna so just to we're gonna take the first sentence out of the um, um, committee Both. charge and then the next sentence I, I, Kathy, do you have it, or do you? Mike, helpful. Across the pool, qualifications of appointees might include a range. And then I have experience serving on finance committees. If you still like the second one, train expertise in policy, economics, or finance, accounting, or actuarial practice skills related to municipal, or maybe just municipal finance. And I can delete the ability to understand data. <laughs> I don't need to put that in. I'm typing as you talk now, so I can be changing this any way you want. Across the appointees, not the pool, OK? The qualifications might include experience serving on finance committees, no capitals, and no in Amherst, other public or private boards or bodies, training experience in economics or finance, munis and municipal finance. I think it should say or exper and experience in municipal finance. Because then if we set if we take out an ab and an ability to understand and interpret financial data spreadsheets, um, the the and has to go before Let's go a little slower. The experience serving on finance committees, other private or public boards, then what's your next one? Training slash expertise in economics or finance. A and experience in municipal finance. Can you add the word interest with the experience? Experience slash interest. 
so you don't, well, we're supposed to try to get um, a balanced committee representing the community. So if you make it too tight a fit, we might not get that. We're adding them to five of us where there will be eight with some balance. So just remember, I mean, it is going to be a group of eight. They don't vote. Right. So do I still have accounting or actuarial as the next? Um, we may decide that that's too specific. Okay. That's, and that's fine. So the first sentence comes from the job, I mean, from the um, charge. committee charge. The second sentence, across the appointees, the qualifications might include experience serving on finance committees or other public or private bodies, training slash experience in economics or finance, colon, and experience slash interest in municipal finance, period. Ideally, residents would represent a mix of experiences and skills, including knowledge of and beyond Amherst. I don't like question one um, because it's too job specific. I think if you just start with the second one, it's a friendlier opening. Okay. We'll have minutes. Well, I, think, I mean, I think that if, if someone knows how to operate the system, you can probably turn it back on. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's a question, you were saying combine it with question five. Um, I think that's an interesting question. Yeah. Some, somehow the first, the, the first question suggested that you might think somebody had an ulterior motive, or was, but when you change it to interest in serving, then the emphasis is on they are volunteering to come forward to help the community. No, I, I, I like the change. Feeling like there needs to be 
I don't want to get too specific on experience or knowledge, but it's almost like it, there needs to be another question like that. I like number two as it's written. I just feel like there needs to be another question that gets at people's experience, et cetera. Maybe so a more open and, and <laughs> yeah, like of anything else you want to share or what, what, you know something that talk more, yeah. I do too, that's why. So, you know, one, the way two is written now, it says any specific areas of interest, if we took that clause out and had a three, um, uh, anything else you'd like to highlight about yourself? Or, it I means you're getting at something just what, brought. What right? else would you like to make sure we know? Yeah, about I, mean, I think of, we're getting to number seven. Lynn, does that do it for you? Yes, it does. Okay. And then so, I just want to go back to the bottom. I don't think your mic is on. Oh, mine isn't. That's right, it isn't. Thank you. Um, so I want to go back to the bottom and just this is for Andy's benefit. Last night when we went through the approval of the revision in the finance committee, um, the uh, GOL recommended that we not refer to a special first round terms in any of these. Um, I have to say I've had some, so therefore they took out the three years, okay? I've had some second thoughts about the three years, and this is my reasoning. I'm trying to figure out how not to bind future councils. So you want to leave remainder? Yeah. Yeah, it was just, I put two years in here because I read the revised charge and I decided we were back to two, so I put two in. Right, and at the end of the two years, we, as a council, may want to assess whether it's worked out to have residents as members of the finance committee. And we may want to recommend um, that we not, that future councils consider that, that maybe they're not going to. I think, I think the council has, this is a broader issue. I, I, I think, think, think that makes sense. Has a lot of learning to do about what it means when you mix counselors with residents on committees. Mm -hmm. So I would like to leave this as two years like you have it, but I wanted Andy to be aware of what changed last night. So the, the last Two sentences then does not, or three sentences doesn't really change. That's correct. That is correct. Okay. okay. Being task oriented at this right. point. Yeah. Then the other thing that got delayed again last night, um, and frankly, some of it was because you weren't there, was we have two different committee reports. One recommends the finance does do the interviewing for this position, and another one recommends that it does not. And the only way I know how to resolve that is to bring it to the full council. I think that's, hmm? I agree with that. So, do we have an opinion on that? Isn't it up to the, the president of the council to appoint to the, 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 all the members of the finance committee? No. no. The members of the, the, yes, the council members of the finance committee, the president gets to appoint. The resident members of the finance committee 
the council appoints. And that is a special, so that if we choose to have residents of the finance committee, then the council appoints. And it's just an odd phrase and a twist of it, if you will, in the charter. The issue that I have gone back to, and that is, this is the only council committee that has residents on it. And given, and therefore I have said, for your own committee, you should at least be able to select your own residents. And yeah. otherwise, at this point, the way the charge reads to OCA mm -hmm. is that they would do all committees, all council appointments. So it's, um, you know, and it, it's come up in the way that we talked about these questions. You know, if, if Andy is the person interviewing people for the finance committee, he, might, he would probably approach the whole process and candidates with a different perspective mm -hmm. because of his vast knowledge of municipal finance than somebody on OCA who has never served on finance. Right. Well, or I, I, I totally agree with you. And I, why not have the chair and vice chair of the finance committee do the interviewing? It would be very nice if they could do that. But right now, if they do that, then it has to be in public meeting. Now we get into that whole other issue. Two people? If two people from the council interview a candidate for an appointment to a committee, then it has to be in open meeting, and it has to be public. Now, let me just explain. There's actually three different ways to do this, from what I understand. And I've, I've now attended so many OCA meetings, I can't count them. The first way is you do everything in public. The second way is you do executive session, and in, the, in those instances that you do executive sessions, you always have to interview one more candidate than you have positions for. I don't think that's a problem. But that's not the, that's not the process OCA has selected. The third one is that you only have one counselor in the room. They can have other people, as could an executive group, an executive meeting. It's, they can have you know, the town manager, they can have Sonia, they can have, you know, some other town person. They could even have somebody from another board, mm -hmm. as long as it's not a board they're being appointed to. And so what we've seen, is, and that is the practice that OCA has chosen. And by the way, that is the practice that some counselors feel should be brought to the full council for a vote. And then, there's, then the whole issue out there is whether or not um, our CAFs should be public. And that's yet, a, yet another issue. And we're trying to get legal read on all of that. I can't imagine, if Andy is doing the interviewing, that he should not be allowed to see all the CAFs. That, that to me is absolutely outrageous. If Andy was going to do the interviews, frankly, if the, if the finance committee is going to take the responsibility for this. All members of the Finance Committee, based on the practice that OCA has described, mm -hmm. we would all see all of the CAFs. What we cannot do is ever discuss them, deliberate, exchange emails, texts, or in any way discuss the candidates. We can see them, but we can't discuss them. But then it doesn't that's, serve any purpose. That's crazy. Problem. And, you know, we're stuck with the open meeting law and sort of these anomalous things about the open meeting law. The biggest one being that if you have a, what it constitutes a subcommittee, the subcommittee has to meet an open meeting. And that makes the process open to the public, which then uh, has the, uh, puts the light of day onto it, but also may discourage applicants and that discouraging applicants is the hard part and and let me just add to that i 
I, without revealing names, I already know of at least one candidate who has been named to a committee uh, and approved who has said they would not have applied if their cap had been public. That's, and if you think back, we've only done two committees. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those. In addition to that, what both Andy and Alyssa and people like Connie Kruger, who's on the Resident Advisory Committee, will tell you it is hard enough to get particularly a diverse applicant pool mm -hmm. by having CAFs be public. And then there's a whole flip side of this. I think of it as a flip side. And that is, I'm Professor X at the university, and I am world renowned in some field. Mm -hmm. And it becomes public that I applied for a committee on that's dealing with X, mm -hmm. and I didn't get appointed. It's a professional embarrassment to me that in my own town I didn't get appointed. So there's there's the sensitivity of the applicants, and so I and at this point, Oka has spent enormous amounts of time on this. Oh my God, fourteen meetings, fourteen mm -hmm. weeks of meetings, trying to come up with a process that is defensible in the open meeting law and respects the privacy of the individuals who have applied. So let, let's explore close executive session. Uh, I would, to me, and you can, you can tell me why this doesn't work, but from what little I know about it, that sounds fine. People do this all the time. I wouldn't do just one extra person. I would do several extra persons so that it's not like I'm the only one that didn't get, get applied. But so maybe you have three spots, you, you interview five or six people. Um, I don't, what's, what is wrong? I mean, I'm sure you have some good reasons, but I just don't know them. What is wrong with doing it that way? It's not clear to me why they didn't go that way, except for the time-consuming nature of interviewing that many people. I, I actually recently had a conversation um, about that, quite making sure that that was, had been fully aired. That, you know, for example, if you were appointing Zoning Board of Appeals, one person is a one-year term, so the law says you have to do two. Two people are two-year terms. The law says you had to do three. Th two people are three-year terms. The law said you had to do two. It, in my mind, that makes sense. And these interviews, by the way, I've gone through one of these interviews when I was selected for um, DPW Fire. They're about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. They're not, it's not like going for an all-day interview for a job. Yeah. It's 20 minutes, so I... Do, do we have the authority to say that we would like to do it with Andy interviewing the applicants and to do it in executive session? Now, if it's just one person, is it executive session? My, th no, if Andy does it and none of the rest of us are in the room, it, it doesn't even have to be a published meeting, mm -hmm. okay? whereas executive sessions have to be. The only thing I would say is that whatever OCA is suggesting as their practice at this point, I feel we have to honor that because of what they've gone through at this point. I think that OCA is very committed to going back and reviewing that practice as they go through this and down the road. So then you're willing to let OCA interview the finance no, no, members? No, that's the, the, to me the issue there's two separable issues. Yeah. Um, one is the practice. So yeah. there's a way of doing the interviews, and it's been decided that one person is doing the interviews on behalf of a committee with an agreed on set of questions, just as we're looking at here. So they're gonna come back, and then the committee, and I'm gonna say the committee right now, rather than which committee, gets to see all the names, and that person is coming back with a recommendation on a, these three. So that's one, that's the practice. The second is, who is doing the interview, and which is the committee seeing it? So rules voted out, um, and then we in finance talked about it, that finance, in this instance, would 
be the committee, and we would designate either Andy or someone else from here, but it, one person, so same practice, one person does the interviews, then that group of five people would get to see the full pool and recommend the three appointments to the full council. So the second issue is, is it OCA doing that or is it finance doing that? Let me suggest, even though, Andy, you pointed out that it's kind of, until you, if you're not going to do the interviews, seeing the CAFs it, for the committee, if, whether it be finance, OCA, or whatever, is not of much use in, re, in reality, is once the person that has done the interviews comes back and says, here's the three people I'm recommending, the rest of the committee has a better ability to judge whether they feel that's a sound recommendation if they've seen all the gaps. Yeah, I mean, I have to look to the uh, experience that we have, and I don't want to go on the bench longer in this, but um, because of time constraints, but when the EAC, when uh, town manager announced his proposed appointees to the EAC, mm -hmm. um, he did not include in his list the people who were not appointed. He only included the people who were appointed. And if you get into the business of including the people who were not appointed, then you get back into what Lynn was saying about the embarrassment that exists in the community of not being appointed and the chilling effect that that has on future um, committee appointments. And that's the struggle, uh, one of the struggles that we're having. Um, the other thing is just that if you have a committee that is looking um, where it's being reported back, I interviewed the following people, and you include all of the people being interviewed, because it's being said to the entire committee, it becomes public who the list was. So I'm not sure how that works. No. That is the process they're using for planning. In other words, they're going to interview everyone who's applied. And OCA, only OCA, will know the full list. Yeah, the full list will never be made. To the, the rest list. of us won't know, but that group of five people are going to know the full list. That is their, the proposed practice. And I, I think the actual practice, it's being implemented this way. I guess I need to see the legal opinion that gets it around that. Um, but they can't, here's the interesting thing, is OCA cannot sit at a meeting after that recommendation is made and say, I know John Jones applied, why didn't you choose him? But they can say something like, having looked at the full pool of people, it seems to me that Mm, you've got too many of these and, not an, and there's no one representing this kind of expertise. Now, here's the, here's the thing I find amazing, and that is um, very likely Sarah, who will be doing the interviewing, will have in the room Paul and maybe somebody from the planning department But, you know, she's not a planner. And I'm not being critical by saying that. I'm just saying it's, this is where the, the we lose the group think, is what I'm concerned about. So. Um, so in my, my summary of my notes basically say, we looked at the qualifications and we looked at the order of the questions and we looked at the practice of interview and we discussed which body and that we agree that this vote should come to the full council as to which body is going to choose, is going to recommend. Okay, so we can't do anything without that. Okay. Um, I don't think so, you got too many conflicting committee reports. Well, some, some people are digging their heels in. On the issue of which body? Yes. Oh, yeah, I'm aware of that. They're also, you know, and I know there's a lot of feeling back and forth 
uh, in the council as to whether or not the full council should see the calves and so forth. Um, right now, the way the last vote that was taken is that we will know of the practice in writing when we receive the um, people who are nominated for appointment for either planning or zoning, whichever comes first. That's the way the yes. that's the way the vote presently is taken. So um, I'm going to turn to Sonia now. We have tentatively placed a meeting for next week. Did we have uh, anyone we were meeting with? Because that's actually the day before the first when the manager's budget will be available. Um, for the yes. I think we do. Yeah. So we are meeting. Yeah. We were referred last night. We were referred CPA. Okay. So, so we're going to do CPA yeah. next week. And that allows us to have a draft, a redraft of this come back to us and uh, put it on the agenda. Well, yeah, and I think that I would not want to do it with. But will we meet on May 2nd? I have finance question mark for May 2nd. That's the Thursday of that of next week. I don't think that we. I have. I don't have that. Uh, I have a meeting next week also. On Thursday or just Tuesday? I think I have both. I just looked at it. Paul had a list last night that I corrected him on. Is it? May 2nd? I do not have. I do not have the second on my calendar. I don't have one on mine either. Okay. And now I have a contract. So, but are we doing, for the 30th, in my book, I have um, FY20 budget projection, FY20 budget preview. Is well, that occurring? No. Or, no. That's not occurring. No, right, I don't have one on the 2nd. I just have one on the 30th. You have a yes. meeting on the 30th, right? We have a meeting on the 30th. So we have a meeting on the 30th, not on the 2nd. Right. And we have then, starting the following week, we have two meetings each because then a number of presentations have been scheduled. Are we going to have a are we going to have a presentation from Paul and Sonia on the budget to, to kind of kick us off? Um, I believe Paul's got to present his budget to the council. So you think he's planning to present to the council on the sixth? I'll have to double check with Paul. I'll have to check on that too. I, that's mm. my job. Sorry, Sonia, I shouldn't have put you on the spot. Okay. Okay, so our next meeting is the 30th. Our next meeting is the 30th and... And we need, we need to use that meeting to review finance, I mean, JCPC. No, on. we need to use it to... It's a Community Preservation Act. CPA. CPA. CPAC. Yes. And I believe, but I will check back with Nate, but I have already asked Nate if he could be here for that. I believe he can make it that day. Thank you. I'll have to double check with Anthony, but I'm pretty sure he can. Great. So um, and then the other agenda item will be to return to the question of the, um, that we had just been talking okay. about with the qualifications and questions. So I did try to type <coughs> quickly and rapidly, but I think, Lynn, as you were dictating, you're going to have the best thing when you look at it, whether I captured it. Yeah. So I, I thought it was helpful, although I didn't see it till now, that Andy just went and dropped another paragraph in. So if people have track edit changes and uh, they could upload it to SharePoint, you know, rather than do it as a group thing, but just send it back or something so we come in if we know we to get as near to final quickly as we can. Yeah. You, you all have it now as an attached file. And I, I want to bring this, the question of which committee to back to the council on, Mar on May 6th. So we want to talk about that next week yep. as a part of this process. Okay, anything else for today? 
I mean, we, have, we have no amendments right now. I, no, I uh, you, no, you actually have. Uh, can't, you gave me authority yeah, to approve. Yeah, did you? Uh, I, you. I not only approved them, but we were missing one day, and I decided I'd be a glutton for punishment, and I sat down and watched the entire Amherst media and created minutes based on my sketchy minutes, and it was when Sean presented to us the first run through the whole thing. So it's a, a very long set, and I've already sent them to Sonia. <laughs> so. Okay, well thank you. Okay, we'll just, and so we're adjourning. I think that uh, unless there's other business that people thought about, we're adjourning. Okay. Agreed? All those in favor, aye. We do. We're done. So, <laughs> that, that and thank you, Amherst Media. <laughs>